Welcome to another edition of Five of the Week. We are a weekly recap show discussing anything that's happening in NCAA basketball in the SBA forums. It's not THE Five of the Week, it's A Select Five of the Week. I am back, uh, well, <laughs> Danger Golding's back. I'm once again joined by him. He can say hi. Hello, I'm Danger Golding. Again, I'm the AD of the West Virginia Mountaineers. Back after missing last week. Let's move on to our first of the week. Uh, it's going to be a short season re. Well, it's not a recap, but a summary of the season so far. So, in the Atlantic Coast Division, we have the Tar Heels leading the pack with a 36 and 15 record, six games ahead of the Gators, and seven ahead of the Duke Blue Devils. In the Big East Division, Villanova leads, holding a 33 and 19 record. Terrapins hijacked the Big Ten. 32 and 20 just ahead of the 31 and 20 shockers and the bearcats trail by three games do you think there's anything any actual surprise packages yet uh not so much uh cincinnati have had a uh, rough last 10 their forms dipped a bit they've only won three of their last 10 so uh, as all scheduling quirks can go, uh, it's kind of hard to tell at this point since you know, some teams have played more home and more away. For example, the uh, Bearcats have played three less games than, or sorry, two less games on the road. They're, they're definitely in a tough spot at the moment. Yeah, no teams in the Big Ten division have a positive record on the road, which is obviously in a tightly contested division sometimes happens and more than often than not happens so in the pacific six arizona runs the house with a 37 to 15 record the oregon ducks now chase by two and a half games arizona also holds the best record in the nation one thing to uh this is the, the the Ducks, actually, despite being uh, two and a half games behind, they've actually got the better point differential, which is interesting. As usually you'd see uh, teams of higher differentials get more wins, but it could be a sign that Oregon are losing quite a few close games that they really should be pulling out. Yep. And the in... Going back to the Atlantic Coast Division, the Tar Heels' dominance inside the division might come as a minor surprise heading into the season, uh, as Duke is a notorious historical powerhouse and the Gators looked well poised to make a challenge for the division title going into the season, but they have looked well worth the record so far this season. Uh, so what about the West Virginia Mountaineers? Just knew this uh, this season was going to start off slow. We've got five five freshmen in the lineup, so that's more than half the team starting on uh, zero. So it was always going to be a slow start, but now they've started uh, earning, uh, getting to the point point where we're starting to compete in games. We've recently made a big defensive change, so we're five and five in our last ten. We lost a few close games, so I think uh, this could be a good turnaround and the second half of the season is going to be a lot better well the offensive workload uh, has been spread between both Mari Creed and Tomislav Ivancic so far and uh, they have been getting a they, they've been creating a buzz for themselves uh, around the league yeah, it's, a, it's a unique kind of team build at the moment it's a lot more balanced than many NCAA teams there's uh, nobody scoring over 20 points a game but all the starters are scoring above 10 and having a uh, talent like Harry Anders Jace Brawley and Danny Jones all coming off the bench is a good sign for the future well uh, of the struggling teams that we might have and I had bid for success this season the Fighting Irish hold an even 500 record and the Michigan State Spartans uh, they have been discussed a lot one game above water with a 27 to 26 record 
Well, the uh, the departure of Edmund Rayfall from the Spartans was always going to leave quite a big hole. But uh, I'm surprised they're, they've done pretty well. Uh, Jad McPherson stabilised a ship and shown that he can run a high-quality NCA offence. Be good, and they're, they're going to continue to be good going on. And both Jad and Hugo need highly sought-after prospects for the pros, I would assume. Yeah, so, definitely. with that one in the bag, I think we covered quite a bit. Um, we'll move on to a complete new discussion, uh, which which had taken shape now that the season's over halfway gone. Uh, the MVP race, who deserves what mentions, who deserves the trophy in the end of the season, uh, our second talking point would be the highest scorer in the league, uh, Robotastic Prime. Uh, Robotastic Prime uh, of the Gonzaga Bulldogs is a 7 foot 1 inch center. He's a junior year player playing 37.5 minutes per game uh, with 32.7 points per game. Uh, he's first in the nation in points scored and 8.7 rebounds per game. He's also third in that category uh, with 2.5 assists to his name as well. He, and his shooting efficiency through shooting percentage is 63.3, which is also first in the nation and a shocking, shocking, huge number. Great efficiency from their star player. The He's a really great talent. We don't see many scorers like him. People were wondering last season, after the the amazing scoring output we saw of Winchester, who was going to be the next top talent that come through that can uh, just straight up get buckets. And this time it's centers topping the list. So Robo's uh, he's leading the Bulldogs, scoring most of their points, and he's winning games along the way. Yeah, the Gonzaga Bulldogs are 31 and 20. 12 and 16 on the road and uh, they are chasing the division rivals Villanova by five and a half games. The question in everyone's mind seems to be is Robotastic Prime the best, hands down best prospect in the nation? I think this uh, the MVP race is going to be the tightest it's been for a while and uh, speaking of that we we uh, briefly mentioned Arthur Hugo Nitt of the uh, Michigan State Spartans. He's a 6'11 center slash power forward and he's playing his, last, his fourth year in the NCAA. 37 minutes a game, 30.7 points per game, that's second just behind prime. Seven rebounds and two and a half assists per game. He's also got a 61.5 true shooting percentage which is good for fourth in the league. So it's, it's tough to say with the I'm getting it over a prime that in wins, points, rebounds. So across the board, his stats are slightly worse than prime. So it's a tough argument for him, at least. Different vein is uh, at the other end of the court is um, Junior Jackson of the Arizona Wildcats. He's a 6'5 point guard as a junior. He's playing 38 minutes a game. And uh, while he may not be scoring above 30 points a game, he's getting 22.8, which is 15th in the league. Almost seven rebounds a game. He's getting 7.1 assists a game, which is sixth. And he's still a top 40 in two shooting percentage, which is can be quite hard to get if you're a point guard who's relying on handling and distributing the ball as well. So he's a quality player and obviously leading, also leading his team to a hefty number of wins. Definitely. Uh, of these three players so far, uh, the Arizona Wildcats, who the who Junior Jackson plays for, uh, they have the best record, and then come the Gonzaga Bulldogs, and obviously the somewhat disappointing season for the Michigan State Spartans could take voting away from Hugo Nitt. Uh, do you think Hugo Nitt is himself underperforming should he and his team be considered at the same level as prime and the gonzaga bulldogs 
I mean, looking at the roster they have, you would expect the Spartans to be doing a bit better. He's he's not only obviously Hugo Nitt is a great player, but he also is, is benefiting massively from the excellent play of having one of the best point guards in Jad McPherson. So he's doing about as good as you can expect, but for some reason it's whether it's the uh, other side of the court and defense, but the Spartans aren't winning as many games as many would have expected to see them winning going into the season. And as you mentioned, uh, Junior Jackson, a point guard totally on the different side of the half court. Uh, what does he bring to the discussion? What is his notable strengths in this MVP discussion compared to Prime and Hugo Nitt? Obviously the team record, but anything in addition to that and this guy is just great all round and on the floor he can get you points at 22 and a half a game obviously get uh, rebounds assists not only that he's racking up almost two steals a game and he's doing all this on pretty good efficiency as well about 49 percent from the field he's shooting 42 percent from free so this guy is just an all-round pretty much every aspect of the ball it's really whether you value the uh all-out scoring of prime or whether you value a more rounded game from a point guard yeah so your answer there might uh, hint to the factor that Hugo Nitt is a level below of prime at least in his production not maybe talent or skill level but in production this year about the Arizona Wildcats, uh, as I mentioned, they have usurped uh, the Oregon Ducks. For the top spot in the Pacific 6th Division, uh, and their roster is a really, really classical kind of a basketball roster. Like, uh, they have smaller players all around the court, but uh, they have large, tall, immobile centers to anchor the defense that gives them a bottom five uh, standing in points against. So even though their record is uh, the best in the nation, uh, they might in a best of one, one game series in the tournament, they might face an early exit, who knows? All right, let's move on to the final discussion point on MVP candidates, Eddie Donovan, also a point guard, 6'3 point guard from the Maryland Terrapins. A sophomore year player, Donovan was named the All-Star Game MVP just this past week for season 37. Donovan is playing 36.8 minutes, 21 points per game. He's top 20 in points per game, 5.9 rebounds to his name and 8.8 .8 assists per game, which nets him the third place, but in any other year might have had him in the top of the assist per game list. And he's also quite efficient with a 59.9 true shooting percentage. He's 11th in true shooting and he's also top 5 in steals. Uh, should Eddie Donovan be talked about more? Does he have any glaring weaknesses in his game? Eddie Donovan, is, uh, his game is getting respected around the league. There's, uh, he's obviously one of the top two point guards, you'd say, along with Junior Jackson. And I know they've got... Uh, rivalry going you see them uh, drawing at each other quite a lot on the court so it's going to be interesting seeing them when they go into the league uh, and where they're going to get drafted honestly a really tough task to ask to pick between those two obviously junior junior jackson slightly better scoring slightly worse assists uh, they did get around the same amount of steals per game so it's tough to say really uh, I think Donovan benefits greatly on the assist side of the game by having two excellent players in uh, Kelvin Culpepper and Alan Richmond, who are both big scorers on his team. So I'm not sure the assist difference makes too much difference in their argument. But honestly, it's it's hard to tell. And it may come down to a team record at the end of the season as to who the uh, ADs decide to vote on for the MVP. Definitely an interesting race to see. Yes, uh, the Terrapins also lead their division currently, 
Donovan's shooting efficiency has improved tremendously this year from 53.8 to shooting to 59.9 and now the Terrapins are once again top 5 in the nation in all of the typical offensive efficiency metrics for effective field goal percentage and offensive rating. So Robotastic Prime uh, profiles more as a pure center type player, but Hugo Nitt, as he's a couple, maybe three inches shorter, he's below seven feet listed, he could possibly play the four position. Uh, if you'd had to rank the top five prospects, who would you select? Uh I think teams at the moment teams are pretty good for the for the point guard spot and there's obviously a ton of guards coming through the league so I I think honestly that with the positional utility I think you go Nit might go first as uh, generally uh, someone who can slip down to the power forward spot is a bit more valuable in the SBA rather than a raw center like Prime of course, it's all going to depend on the team's fit and who wins the lottery. If you're a team that wants a guard, you're definitely going to be looking at Jackson or Donovan. Or if you need to fill a spot in the front court, then it's going to be Prime or Hugo Nip. I think Hugo Nip probably just because of the versatility and he's they're, they're quite similar in talent. I think Hugo Nip will have the slight edge on most GM's draft boards. Yeah, I also have Hugo Nip as number one uh, if we're going solely on the best player available basis and I have uh, aside of the guards I uh, have prime as number two I don't necessarily think he could slide any further than number two in pure talent rankings because his numbers are just eye-popping numbers and he's carrying his team on a nightly basis uh, depend on whereabouts the pick picks land. Obviously, uh, the 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 biggest contender for the number one pick is the Atlanta Vipers, and they have uh, power forward and centers already in Rayful and McLeod. Mm -hmm. So, I, I imagine there's a decent possibility that Donovan or Jackson might go first if the Vipers land that number one pick. All right. So, Donovan and Jackson also probably fill the top five in pure talent rankings from our perspective who would you pick as the outsider uh, we only covered four so who would you pick as the fifth <laughs> fifth uh the fifth pick uh it's a tough one to say to be honest i think uh because versatility is such a, a massive gain in the SPA. You want players that can switch and move to every position. So I think Raphael Nazarians is probably the uh, highlight for the fifth pick. He's a, he's a freak who can play at almost every position. Uh, also uh, to Isaiah Green of the Villanova Wildcats. He's going to be he's a great player bringing an expansion team to one of the best records in the entire league which is no laughing matter in fact i think they have the best record at the moment oh well one one of the best one of the best records in the league and uh he's definitely been putting up some really big numbers my my homer pick would be uh miles lefebvre from the duke blue devils but obviously uh for his scouting profile, you could see the weaknesses of his game. Uh, no scoring output, kind of whatsoever, and uh, a fantastic perimeter defender, but uh, and a playmaker, but no no sense of scoring or no proof of scoring on the college level either. So, uh, to me, my selection for the fifth spot would be Nazarians or then just a complete out of the bushes surprise selection maybe velvet smooth from the shockers maybe the gifted guard tyron kings of the Tar hills who also have a good record this year or then the aforementioned isaiah green uh, either or 
good fill in this spot, but I'm gonna go with Nazarians. Yeah, it's a it's a deep, uh, fairly deep draft this year. So there's gonna be talent going all the way through the first round, and we're gonna see um we're gonna see some top teams getting quite a few steals, I think, with their late picks in the first round. Yeah, players such as maybe Jad McPherson uh, and the Tres Puntos from the Michigan State Spartans, or then the Notre Dame Fighting Irish pair, could fall, uh, could slide down the draft because of their respective college records this year. And they, from what we have seen, could be an asset going forward to a pro team and then going to a bottom half of the first round would be a gift for the drafting team. I believe that to be all of our five of the week. Uh, season summary so far and some of the MVP candidates in the bag this week. A big thank you for a cryptic pancake for hosting in Danger Golding's absence last week. And speaking of Danger Golding, you have anything else to add? Uh, yeah, I just wanted to tell everyone and all the listeners to keep an eye out on the NCAA network and the SBA network pages. There's starting up voting for articles of the week. So you can just read through the articles that all our talented writers have been producing and you can decide which one has been the best. There might be some rewards in the future, but at the moment it's just go on there and give some appreciation to the people that put out the quality content that we all love to read. All right. Thank you. That's and everything for me. And uh, a thank you for everyone listening. And we'll hope to catch you once again next week with five of the week.